It's a pleasure to be here. I have three guests that I'll introduce shortly. But I want to begin with the most simple of statements. I believe that we can have more effective and more efficient prenatal care. Now that concept shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody hearing it because the prenatal care that we experience today had its design more than 100 years ago. It was designed at a time when telephones weren't invented. So in prenatal care, we have certainly not captured the opportunities to take advantage of today's technology and new connectedness in order to do a better job of serving our mothers. We have a long ways to go. So when I took on my current role as chair of OBGYN in Rochester, I knew I had an opportunity to go after this question and to say, what are we doing now and what can we do better? I met with obstetricians and my obstetrics team consistently came up with four questions that I think helped frame the ideas. What parts of prenatal care really help to ensure healthier moms and healthier babies? And how poorly or how well are we meeting the expectations and needs of our mothers? What parts of prenatal care really have to be done in a clinic and office setting? And the overriding question, are we getting our money's worth as individuals who consume the product of prenatal care and as a society that backs up and lends importance to the concept of prenatal care? Are we anywhere close to getting our money's worth? So we went exploring, and I became sort of the obnoxious traveler. Everywhere that my Mayo Clinic job took me across the nation and across the planet, I would seek out the obstetricians, and I would say, what do you do for prenatal care? What does it look like in your state or in your country? And not surprisingly, I got a lot of answers that showed that there were common themes to what people do. And not surprisingly, I found out that there were differences in the way prenatal care was administered. And also, not surprisingly, everybody who was delivering prenatal care was sure that their model had it exactly right. But the biggest challenging statement that I got when I was exploring this came as I was talking to a physician from Saudi Arabia. Now raise your hand if you think Saudi Arabia was the likely place to find answers or best challenges for prenatal care. It certainly surprised me. But this physician said, you've medicalized it. Medicalized it. We assume that it's medical in the US, and so we've created a big structure around the medical provision of prenatal care. In Saudi Arabia, a woman visits her physician three or four times during her pregnancy. You've medicalized it. We've made these moms think that it's a fragile condition that they need to be carefully monitored and watched instead of empowering them to take good care of themselves. So we asked questions, we went exploring, and then we considered, what are the ramifications if we do this differently? What if that Saudi model has got it right and we really could reduce 60 to 70% of the scheduled prenatal visits and release the workforce involved in that and release the moms who are busy driving to and from and parking and walking in and waiting in lobbies for these prenatal checks? Well, it's pretty simple mathematics. We came up with the concept that we would release about one, one million provider days across this nation if we were able to eliminate unnecessary prenatal visits. And even more significantly, if these moms didn't have to get babysitters, drive to the prenatal clinic, sit in the prenatal office, have their prenatal visit, get back out and do the whole reverse, we could capture back almost seven million working days for the mothers in the United States of America and free them up to do the things that they're passionate about. Now, it doesn't mean we'd eliminate all these visits, but the visits would be changed so they would occur when the mothers needed them or when the physician recognized a need for them instead of some metronomic schedule that says, today is the day for your prenatal visit because the metronome hit that side. It becomes real and active. It serves the patient's needs. We know what high value prenatal care is. It means we have to be able to say we're showing you ways to get healthier mothers or healthier babies or more prepared families and that we're utilizing the resource as well. When we came up to this, we knew that we had an idea and a concept that had great potential for really changing one of the most common medical experiences in the US, prenatal care. 
But we knew that before we acted on these ideas, it would be important to listen to the mothers. So today, I have three brave mothers who agreed to be here with me and to talk a little bit about what it's like to receive prenatal care. I want to begin by introducing my partner, Lene Barkey. She's my administrative partner in the department of OBGYN. And Lene has had two experiences of pregnancy and prenatal care. And that's important. But a big reason Lene's on the stage is because much of this concept that we now call OB-NEST started with her observation when she used the words for the first time, prenatal care from home. That was sort of the inception or conception, if you will, of this idea, and I want to give credit to that. Now, I said Lene had two experiences of prenatal care, but in many ways she's having a third experience now because Carrie Hack is her sister here today, and Carrie is very obviously interested in prenatal <laughs> care. <laughs> she's due in a couple of weeks and bravely, courageously said that she'd be on stage with us and talk about the prenatal care she's getting in this very traditional model of prenatal care. Andrea Peterson is the mother of a one-year-old, and Andrea was pregnant at the time we were doing some of the first experiments for OB-NEST. So Andrea had the experience of prenatal care in a non-traditional setting, not the complete package of OB-NEST, but participating in the multiple experiments that were designed in order to try to explore this idea. So as the experiments were going on, we heard some very common themes repeated from the mothers who were exploring prenatal care. And these women have agreed to do some reflection on those common comments. So as you can tell from my more outdated photo you saw on the last slide that my babies are perhaps a bit older than these two young mothers that are on stage with me today. Uh, my children are now 16 and 13, but as any of you women in the audience know who have survived pregnancy and motherhood, you know that you never forget your prenatal experience and your delivery experience. So as I reflect on the differences in those two pregnancies, with the first pregnancy, I was very eager to acquire knowledge anywhere I could find it. I read everything, I looked forward to my prenatal visits, I took every prenatal class that there was in hopes of really being prepared and ensuring that my baby was healthy. The second time around, I really wished I could have had the Cliff Notes version, not gone in for quite as many visits, um, as they offered far less value to me as a second time mother. Andrea, I know you have a very different experience. Yep, exactly. The pregnancy in which I was involved with the OB Nest program was actually my third pregnancy because my husband and I had two miscarriages, apologize. And so for this third experience, I was really looking for something. Um, I, need, I had a lot of questions and I really needed more reassurance during those early weeks. Good. And early on in my pregnancy, I had a lot of questions. Um, questions mostly about the back pain I was experiencing. I knew back pain was a normal symptom of pregnancy, but I um, ignored a lot of questions, questions about changes I was experiencing. Um, and then a week later, wound up in OB triage with something called an incarcerated uterus, which basically was stuck in my bladder and not allowing me to go to the bathroom. It was one of the most painful things. I don't wish it upon anybody, but I like to think that had I been connected with a care team and um, been able to directly speak to a nurse that knew me, um, being a part of that nest program, I don't think it would have happened. Those questions wouldn't have been ignored. Now also, being that it's my first pregnancy and a, a long-awaited one, my husband and I tried for a few years before we were blessed with this baby. And um, so you're very eager for all those appointments, initial appointments. But I quickly remember calling Lene and saying, they just kind of seem like a waste of time by the time you drive, park, pay to park, walk in. Um, I don't work at the Mayo Clinic, so it's kind of a zoo to me. At, at least it seemed that way initially. And um, of course, the appointments are worth it because all you want is the comfort of your baby's heartbeat. But um, to find out that there's other ways that I could be hearing the baby's heartbeat and mm -hmm. um, from what Andrea went through, it just sounds like what a, what a way to do prenatal care. Mm -hmm. And through the OB nest experience, I was able to take home an, a fetal Doppler, and I was given an acceptable range for where the baby's heartbeat should be and resources should I have a measurement that is outside of that acceptable range, and I know that I should make a phone call right away. But I was able to take the Doppler home and share that experience with my husband, and I'd come home from work, kick my feet up in the chair, and we'd listen to the baby's heartbeat, and we have a three-year-old lab at home, and she did not like the sound that the Doppler would make, but it just gave her a little bit of a warning of what the baby would be like once she came home. <laughs> <laughs> but 
because that was her first reaction as well. But, and my mom lives outside of town, and so when she would come to Rochester and visit us, then I would, could share that experience with her as well. I love the idea of being able to have your husband at every appointment. Obviously, he wasn't able to go to all those beginning appointments, so just to be able to do that together seems like such a unique experience. And one size doesn't fit all. I think, you know, sharing our experiences, we've kind of learned a lot from each other. And I was able, I, I was fortunate to have that Doppler at home because I got the reassurance that I needed between those longer spaced appointments in those earlier weeks. Because during that time period, I had more questions and needed more reassurance. And so as part of the OBNS project, I kind of filled those needs during the long spaced visits. And my, um job is a little unique. I'm a school teacher for nine months of the year, and then I head to Maine for the summer where I work at a summer camp, and I've done it for 10 years. This summer was a little different in the sense that I'd be going at 23 weeks pregnant and needed to find my own health care in Maine, so I kind of disconnected from Mayo for a few months, and I randomly chose a doctor off of a website, and <clears throat> needless to say, I wasn't too impressed with my care out there, but I felt that I wasn't as connected here. Um, the long drive, I, my camp the location was an hour away from Portland, so I, by the time you drive, again, just it seemed like such a waste of time, worth it because of the heartbeat. While I was out there, I also had to have the glucose tolerance test, and when the results came back, and my, they recommended the three-hour test, and I immediately wanted to know, what would, what would Mayo say about that? So I called my sister because I didn't have a direct line to call to get the information otherwise, and... Right. And I was, of course, compelled to help her, um, but I didn't know either. So I went down networking and chasing the answer down um, only to find, you know, our range would not require her to repeat the test, but I didn't feel comfortable telling her not to go have that test done. And so, again, she went through another needless appointment hours away, and you can imagine what that was like. So um, only to have it repeated, and, of course, the end result was perfectly fine. So another wasted visit. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like a lot of confusion right. that could have been alleviated mm -hmm. with that connected yeah. care mm -hmm. that we had through the NEST program. Right. That would be right. nice. Yeah. And I had so many questions during those early weeks, and the nurse's line was an excellent resource. And one morning I woke up with what I thought were flu-like symptoms, and I was talking with my husband, like, I don't know if I can make it to work today. And he encouraged me to call in, and the nurse was able to reassure me that it's just morning sickness, which is obviously common with pregnancy. And so making that connection really helped um, reassure me that what I was experiencing was normal. And I remember feeling a lot of anxiety when I initially went to Maine. Um, that was right around the time when the you're supposed to feel the baby kick. And I have a job where I'm on my feet all day, and I, it's my first pregnancy, so I wasn't really sure what what is that supposed to feel like. And I kind of hid those anxieties and um, didn't didn't question it, but. Um, I think that had I been able to call a nurse or connect with that online care community and just get some comfort that way, I would have been a lot less mm -hmm. or more at ease, I should say. Mm -hmm. At the same time, getting ready to return home from Maine, I had another appointment scheduled out there. I had an appointment here at Mayo a week later, but I was flying, so I wanted to make sure everything was okay. Um, again, it was just one of those kind of wasteful appointments, finding out now that there's things that we can do I could have done that at the camp and not having to, not had to have driven into Portland. So mm -hmm. the OB Nest project just seems like such a, a way to, mm -hmm. for all the. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And through the, through the project, I was able to experience many, many of those other communication tools. Like my husband and I were able to connect with our physician through a Skype visit. And there were online forums where you can post a question and receive uh, responses from providers so you know what's reliable response, it's not just a random website. <laughs> and also text messaging, which is something that's very common in our, at least my generation in today's society. And so having those tools available were very beneficial for me and kept me informed and kept that connection with my, with my provider. And I also used an, a mobile app at the time, and at the time the Mayo app wasn't available. So I'm really looking forward to my next pregnancy and being able to utilize that tool as well. Thank you, it was so important to hear from the mothers. And then a team of obstetricians worked well with a team of design experts from the Center for Innovation and started to say, if we are to capture what the obstetricians think is important and what the patients think is important, and we're able to utilize our current technologies to really connect, what might we design? 
the team came up with 13 change experiments that said these might be components of a new and better system. And over the course of the following year, worked with pregnant moms like Andrea to, to try out the components. We're gonna go into detail about a few of these here and, and not every one. We're not gonna go in detail on the one that I think has got my favorite name, which is tummy photos. But one of the things obstetricians do is just take a look and say, is that belly growing at about the right rate? as a very simple way of saying, are things going on inside? So moms were able to use their cameras and send in belly photos and say, yep, looks like everything's well, in addition to others. The component of prenatal care that the doctors were most concerned about is if they allow moms to use the Doppler to find their own baby's heartbeat. The doctors were concerned that that would cause the moms to have a lot of anxiety, to not be able to find the heartbeat, and that the number of phone calls would go up six, eight, 10, 50 fold. Um, that was the fear of physicians. But what we saw from parents really mirrors a lot of what Andrea shared with you there, that it was very comforting. These moms got good. They got good very fast. They knew exactly where their baby's heartbeat was. They were able to adjust week by week. They knew if it was on the right side or the left side. And they found it very comforting to be able to just check in and see that all's well inside there, especially during the part of pregnancy when the baby wasn't kicking and moving around yet to the point that they could perceive it. The moms also really appreciated direct access communication. Most communication with the prenatal office right now means you have to talk to a desk staff and tell that, person, tell that person your story, and then that person sends you to a nurse who you have to tell your story, and then that person may or may not send you to your MD or midwife provider and tell your story again. The moms loved the idea that they could text in, get rid of the phone uh, chasing that might happen over the next four hours, and wait for a text answer saying, sounds OK, thanks for checking in, or need to talk to you later, or you should come in. So it really served the moms well to take advantage of that modern communication. The online communities were designed so that women at common stages of gestation could get together online, ask a question, share a question, get an answer, see somebody else's question that they hadn't even thought of and read that answer, so that everybody at 12 weeks was sharing their story of what are the concerns at 12 weeks, and everybody at 20 weeks was sharing their concerns of what, what's going on at 20 weeks. It was a great way to use electronic connections. So globally, the picture sort of looked like this, taking it from a sickness model where it's patients coming to a clinic and changing it to a model where the mother is at the center of prenatal care. And when mom's at the center, amazing things happen. That mom grows in her sense of autonomy and confidence and empowerment that she is monitoring her own well-being. That mom is also able to link and connect with the people around her so that her bridge of connection and support is different than just me and my provider. It's myself, my provider, my mothers, my sisters, the people around me, and she grows that support. And through prenatal care at home and that kind of connectedness, we also signaled loud and clear, this is a normal process. You should engage in the joy and the wonder of it instead of the worry of it all the time. We signal that this is something to enjoy and celebrate. We also were able to be responsive to the moms so that the asynchrony between moms' perceived needs for connection and the medical center's perceived need for connection can be straightened out. We're able to respond and connect when the moms need it. I love the analogy that Marnie from the Center for Innovation had with this where she said, right now what we do is sort of like the worst of an adolescent romance. I don't need you as much as you need me. Now I need you more than you need me. It's way better to straighten that out and be there for the moms and be able to show that we can meet their expectations. And when we globally put it together, it has a pattern and a rhythm something like this. There are a few pre-scheduled visits, but mostly we're checking in, contacting, finding out how things are going, and we are there and responsive when the moms need it. It is connected care. It's not isolated events. I'm gonna see you now and I will see you in four weeks. Good luck in between. It is, I am here and we are connected throughout the course of this pregnancy. So why is this important, especially to the half of the audience that has no intention of ever having prenatal care in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> I think it's important because it's a change in the relationship. It's a way to get a prepared mother and an empowered mother and a genuine partnership between the healthcare team and the mom and the family. And Roger Harms, one of our obstetricians who was really integral to designing this, also pointed out it should result in decreased interventions. When a woman shows up in a doctor's office, when anybody who calls himself a patient shows up in a doctor's office, doctors feel like we should do something. 
getting her out of the office and moving the communication to Skypes or electronic connection signals, we're okay, we're having a conversation, we don't need an intervention, except when we do need an intervention. So it's really a chance to change that relationship. And I think this has tremendous potential. If we teach mom this kind of empowerment during her prenatal care, what will it mean for the way she interacts with the healthcare system going forward as she guides and directs the healthcare for that family? I think, in its best sense of the word, this is motherhood unleashed and empowered to seek the absolute best health and to know that she is an integral partner in the best health for her family. Motherhood unleashed, now that type of power has the chance to change the world. Thank you. Go ahead, sit, sit down guys, particularly, particularly you. I don't want you to stand Sorry. there while I ask questions. I mean, uh, we had uh, three pregnancies of our own in, in our family, uh, two twin pregnancies, and then a, a singleton a little later on. Um, did you do a lot of tetherball this summer at the summer camp in Maine? Uh, no, not a lot of tetherball. No, no, a lot of walking, though. It was, all right. it was good for me. Great. Well, no, I, I admire. That's really <laughs> terrific. Um, would you say, and I, I'm just interested in hearing you talk, that as you went to um, prenatal visits, and particularly the difference between first and second pregnancy in your case, there was no recognition that you had an acquired knowledge the second time around. Obviously, you mentioned that I needed it less the second time around, but was there any recognition from the doctor that you had an acquired knowledge the second time around? I think there's a recognition of it, but I think that the model still is one size fits all. There were no fewer visits, the appointment length. I remember coming to the very first new OB visit and it was still, it was the same length of time as it took for uh, the first time pregnancy. So you're basically just uh, a gestation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> gestation one, gestation two, gestation three. Wow. Please introduce us. This is Anna. Yeah. She's almost 14 months. Fantastic. Yeah. And husband Corey. And my husband Corey, sorry. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Corey. Hi. Yeah, Corey, okay. fatherhood is rough. This is Anna. Oh, and then. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey. That's what grandma's do to us. Too. Yep. I'm and, well yeah, it's right, so right. To, to carry the uh, medical analogy mm -hmm. further, you're a gestation, you're the baby holder. Right. right there we go. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, to use a Saudi term, um, if the individual who regarded America's notion or Mayo's notion of prenatal care as medicalizing an event, is this demedicalizing it or is it re medicalizing it in the sense that we retain a certain amount of medicine. I heard a lot of medicine talk even in the experiments that you were doing. Well, I think it's changing it from medical focus to health promotion focus. And I think that's what's really key is to do everything we can to dispel the sense that this is disease about to happen and switch the focus to saying we're monitoring and we're watching and we're educating but we are not expecting bad outcomes and we're not expecting disease. We're expecting outcomes like this beautiful child. <laughs> Does the prenatal experience uh, have a built-in tension with any of your other interactions with doctors in the sense that uh, moms are, I mean, aside from you know, pediatricians who see kids who are ostensibly healthy um, on their checkups, and that varies from culture to culture, family to family in the United States, which is another subject, but mm -hmm. in general, in the prenatal care, it's the only time you're going to a doctor when you're absolutely healthy, right? So you're encouraged to maybe bring patterns of, there must be something wrong, I'm pregnant. Wait a minute, there's nothing wrong. So do you think the ideas that you discussed here are workable in all of healthcare, not just simply uh, the prenatal experience? I think they are, and I think Andrea can probably speak to it best as she participated in the experiments, but we've heard mothers who have commented that they felt more empowered and more in charge of their own, you know, pattern of care that they were seeking out, and, I, and we've talked about how that has uh, translational um, capability for other aspects of health care. Patients should be more in charge. Right. In right. All and it should be a genuine partnership. Yeah. The, the old concept that 
the medical system holds all of the knowledge and power and you will come to the source of knowledge and power when you have an issue is really ineffective and it, it ought to change to reinforcing the wisdom and knowledge of people around the planet and reinforcing then that partnership relationship with the healthcare system. Does the nest concept that you developed, do you think it works from culture to culture? Did you look at any sort of different, um, uh, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering what your, how diverse your sample group was in this particular case and how interested you are in seeing how this would work in other populations, urban populations, that sort of thing. Well, you're ahead of us some, but I can't wait to see where we can go with it. Our, our next step is to invite 120 women to participate in the full program of OB Nest as a substitute for uh, traditional prenatal care. What Andrea did is sort of layered some of these things on top as she participated in the experiments. And I have to applaud you, Andrea, for participating in those because <laughs> you didn't have any idea what you were signing up for, including that it would land you on stage someday. <laughs> but, but our next step is to take 120 women and get them all the way through with some careful metrics to again say, are we meeting the needs to ensure that we're able to provide the safety net that says, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe, we need to watch closer here. We believe the experiment supported it, but we need to try the whole package. Oh, well, it's fascinating. Andrea, just one question. You mentioned how excited you were about the notion of a Mayo mobile app mm -hmm. coming down the pike. You weren't saying that you were excited to get pregnant so you could experience the mobile app. <laughs> well, maybe. Is that a responsible form of family planning, Daddy? <laughs> uh, whatever, he says. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.